I do want to start my comments by uh, perhaps connecting something that Dr. Smith said, uh, which is the, the relationship between the priest uh, abuse crisis and what we're talking about this evening, which is humanivite. And it's certainly true that uh, involved in dissent from a teaching like humanivite is often this kind of giving up on the high idea of holiness. You know, holiness is just not really uh, a concrete possibility. It's not really the idea that we have to hold out. And it reminds me of uh, my favorite paragraph in Veritati's Splendor from St. John Paul II, whose feast day we celebrate today. And he's uh, critiquing a particular school of moral theology called the Proportionalists, and who dissent from many church teachings. And he says, uh, what they say is that, the Proportionalists say that the Gospel is only an ideal and it must be accommodated to the concrete possibilities of man. And so Jesus lays out an ideal, but it, we have to accommodate that to what are my concrete possibilities or your concrete possibilities. And then you see one of the few times that St. John Paul II gets angry in writing. And then he says, he says, well, what are the concrete possibilities of man? And which man are we talking about? Man who has fallen and sinned in Adam? A man who has been redeemed by Christ. And what are the concrete possibilities of the one who has been redeemed by Christ? The concrete possibilities for him are holiness. And holiness is the answer to the crisis around humanity vitae and the sexual revolution. And it's the answer to the priest crisis, as Dr. Smith was just talking about. And so what I want to talk about is how Humanae Vitae calls all of us to holiness, and in particular married people. Of course, uh, what Humanae Vitae is trying to do is to protect this truth that marriage is a sacrament. We believe marriage is a sacrament. What's a sacrament? A sacrament is a physical, tangible thing that gives grace. And every sacrament gives two kinds of grace. I'm a sacramental theologian, so these are the things I studied. And uh, every sacrament gives two kinds of grace. It gives an increase in sanctifying grace. And it gives a, a sacramental grace, a grace particular to that sacrament. And the sacramental grace of marriage is the grace to be able to love as Christ loved the church. To be able to love one's spouse just in the way that Christ loved the church. And the whole point of the sacrament of marriage is to invite two people to imitate this covenantal love that Jesus lived with the church. It's a beautiful line in the document from Vita Consecrata, where uh, St. John Paul II, Vita Consecrata is writing on consecrated life, right? But he says this line. He says, it is in contemplation of the crucified Christ that all vocations find their inspiration. It is in contemplation of the crucified Christ that all vocations find their inspiration. Well, what is happening on the cross? Jesus is pouring out his life for us in covenantal love. And that covenantal love is fruitful, producing life for all of humanity. You ever wonder why Jesus looks from the cross and says to Mary, Woman, behold your son. When was the last time Jesus called his mother woman, by the way? Well, it was at the wedding feast of Cana, right? Here at the cross, he calls her by the same name. And he says, behold your son, because of course at that moment, as Mary consents to this spiritual marriage, she becomes the mother of the church. And so John the disciple becomes her mother, her son, because the cross is a fruitful marriage. This is why St. John Paul II theologically, excuse me, St. Paul VI, theologically says there must be a connection between the two dimensions of, sexu of the sexual act, the unitive and the procreative. Theologically, it's because they're part of the covenant, right? Now, he speaks about it mainly in terms of natural law in the document, right? That these two aspects are part of what God put in nature. It's unitive and it's procreative. 
But we understand it as part of the covenant, right? What are the vows that couples take on their marriage day? They come, and they are asked questions, right? Have you come here freely and without reservation to give yourselves to each other? Will you love and honor each other as husband and wife for the rest of your life? Will you accept children lovingly? Well, why do we ask these questions? Because that's the expression of covenantal love. What is covenantal love? It's the love that Jesus exemplifies on the cross where he makes a total gift of himself for us in a way that is fruitful. This is, of course, one of the great beauties of marriage, as Beth and Sam have testified, which is the fruitfulness of love brings children into the life of a marriage. And children are the greatest possible gift that anyone could receive in this world. The only gift that God could give a couple that will last forever. Because every child has an immortal soul. Every child is directly willed and loved by God, capable of knowing love and being loved because they're a human subject like us. And it's no accident that children come from an act of love. It says something about who children are. As I used to say to the couples when I was preparing them for marriage, your love is so real that when you express it nine months later, you might have to give it a name. And it will last and live forever. Forever, right? This is the whole distortion that humanity Vitae has created in our culture because it makes us think that children are accidentally connected with sex. People even say it, we got pregnant by accident. I always think, were you, were you walking under a tree? <laughs> it's only one way I know to get pregnant. It's hard to do by accident, right? When you get pregnant, it's because your body worked the way it was designed to work by God. Because you, in an expression of covenantal love, were able to experience the beauty of this divine fruitfulness. Of course, it can happen outside of an expression of covenantal love. But the divine fruitfulness points, actually, to the fact that it's supposed to happen within an expression of covenantal love. We see the ways that the contraceptive mentality has corrupted our thinking, but contraception doesn't just make sex less procreative, it also makes it less unitive. Here again is where St. John Paul II's teaching is so beautiful. He makes the point that all corruptions of sex have to do with turning the person before me who is a subject into an object. That all corruptions of sexuality are about objectifying a person and then using them for my benefit. Which if you think about it long enough, you'll see this is precisely what contraception does and it's precisely why contraception is so destructive to people because it allows us to objectify the other person and use them for our own pleasure. Rather than the couple who makes a total self-gift to each other within marriage, who actually always reverences the other person as a subject. And in that reverence is completely open to the other person, ready to give everything, including their ability to be a mother or a father. When I hold that back, it's less than what covenantal love is supposed to be. And John Paul II has this beautiful teaching about how in marriage, love covers shame. Remember, because of the fall, we all have concupiscence, and therefore we have shame connected to sexuality. It's just part of what it means to be human. It's why, by the way, sex outside of marriage is so spiritually damaging to people. That's why my experience is most young people in our culture do more damage in their souls in the first month of college. It'll take them 10 years to repair. Because our culture tells them you have to experience, experiment sexually. And that's going to create shame and guilt and all kinds of spiritual damage. You can't stop it, right? Because as the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. When we sin, it pays us back with death. It brings death into our life. Even if you don't know it's a sin, it still brings death into our lives, into our hearts. And so 
What St. John Paul II says, however, is the beauty of marriage is that because of the covenantal love and the commitment of love, because of the lifelong commitment, because of the total desire to give it to each other, love covers the shame. And so therefore, once again, a couple can be naked without shame, like Adam and Eve were, because they're protected by love. You see how different that is from the use of a person? And it's all rooted in reverence. He makes the point, it's actually possible for couples not using contraception to still sin in sexuality, in marriage, if they're not being reverent. Reverence is what always rec uh, recognizes the subject before me. This is, of course, what separates us from the animals. The, uh, the uh, final point I want to make, and then maybe tell a couple of stories, is um, that I really believe humane vitae and the crisis that we have experienced is a crisis of faith. And it's a crisis of faith because to live the church's teaching, to believe that holiness is possible, even though it's difficult, to try to live the church t church's teaching requires me to surrender my life more completely to God. Beth and Sam just gave an incredible testimony to that, right? They didn't ask for the difficulties that came into their marriage that would require abstinence for a year. But because they wanted to be faithful to God, they were invited to surrender their lives to God. And they realized something was possible that seemed impossible because of Christ's love, right? NFP and the church's teaching around contraception requires the surrender of control. In fact, I think this is why it's most challenging for our culture, because we live in a very materialistic culture where we begin to believe we can control everything. And Pope St. Paul VI speaks about this in, in the encyclical Humanae Vitae. He says, to try to control life is to play God. And we are called to surrender our lives to God, not to try to control it. But this is, of course, what makes NFP so difficult. It's not all in my control. Contraception is so much easier, except for the death that it brings and the objectification that it brings. NFP forces me to grow in my prayer life, in my trust in God, in my relationship with my spouse. Lived rightly, it can bring deep, deep surrender to God and deep holiness. I remember some years ago uh, reading, a, story, reading a, a survey by Ann Landers. Well, not everybody in the room is old enough to know who Ann Landers is, but Ann Landers was a gossip columnist in the 1980s, and she was popular uh, amongst American women. And she once did a survey of all of her married women readers. And the survey was, how many of you married women would prefer just to be held by your husbands and not to actually have sex? And 70% of Ann Landers' married women readers responded yes to that question. Now maybe her, the, her, the husbands of those women were particularly bad just because they were Ann Landers readers, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a pure survey, right? But of course what it says is what? 70% of her readers said, at some level I feel used by my husband and I'd prefer just to be held and not to have sex because then I would feel more reverenced. Right? Well, when Couple to Couple League, which as you might know is a national group of, of people who teach natural family planning, they teach couples to other cu couples teaching other couples, they saw this survey, so they did a survey of all their members. How many of you couples who practice NFP in your marriage would prefer, the women, would prefer just to be held by your husbands and not to have sex? 7%. Why? Well, because they were being held 49 days every month. Right? During those periods, or for sometimes longer periods, as Sam and Beth have testified to us, right? The point is that in this way, the church is teaching, although at times very demanding, and uh, Sam and Beth give us an example of those times when it could be very demanding, when in fact we surrender our lives to God, 
and we place our trust in him, then the concrete possibilities of man are different, and real holiness becomes possible. Let me just tell you one story of friends of mine. This is a true story who um, tell a story of trusting in divine providence with natural family planning. So uh, they had five children, and the husband was a salesman, and he had been struggling a lot in his life as a salesman. And uh, in fact, for the better part of six months, had barely brought home any salary. And so they were working very hard not to conceive children at this time because they already had five, and it was a very difficult financial period. And uh, one day the wife feared she might be pregnant. And so she tried to kind of pretend that maybe that wasn't the case and ignore it and didn't say anything to her husband. Eventually she went to the doctor and she discovered that she was pregnant with triplets. You can imagine how terrified she was to have to tell her husband, right? She tells the story, though, that that day she was there trying to figure out how she was going to say this to her husband when he came home because she knew she would have to. And he came home and he looked completely stunned. And he sat down on the couch and he said, I don't, I don't know how to explain what happened today. And she said, well, what happened? He said, well, I made a very large sale. In fact, I made three years' salary today. <laughs> and she said, well, that's good because we're going to have three more children. <laughs> the point is that God actually does work miracles. And sometimes those miracles come through suffering but he actually does work miracles. And when we're committed and desirous of being faithful to that teaching, then we begin to see that, that as I said, real holiness is possible. Thank you.